Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. Today is my wife Diane's birthday. I'm not going to spend the whole episode talking about her. I really could, but that's not something she would appreciate on her birthday. But she's absolutely fantastic and listens to all the episodes, which is worth a lot. <laughs> and so that's kind of fun that she can ask me questions about that. This one with uh, Jim Telford, I think she'll enjoy because it's the second part of our conversation, comparing and contrasting the world of wine. And also there's a father-son aspect. Thanks, Jim Telford, for sharing your story and thinking out loud with me about how you could do something that'd be fun and uh, blending in your passions. So uh, my passion is Diane <laughs> and also sports cards. Today's a great day and I uh, hope you enjoy the episode, our conversation. Happy birthday, Diane. And I do a lot of men's dinners. I haven't done it as much with COVID, but gathering guys to come together. It's not a bar here, but I have a back house, a little bit of boardroom feel. And I do serve wine and guys will bring whiskey. <laughs> They'll bring scotch. And I say, guys, I thought we are just having soda and wine. And they drink what they want to drink. My father-in-law has a scotch club. Once a month, they get together and they're all in their 70s, 80s, 90s even. And they just enjoy, what do they have it? There's 12 of them. So 12 is one and a half ounce times 12 is 18. So basically they knock out a couple of bottles and they'll compare. So they have fun and they talk about politics, religion, any of the stuff you're not supposed to talk about. I think your podcast, your YouTube channel, your bars, all that stuff, it's a place where people can talk about stuff they want to talk about. If your podcast or your YouTube channel epitomizes that, I think people would enjoy it. They're overhearing either your thoughts or your thoughts along with somebody else, whether there's a father-son thing occasionally. I've had a real kick out of doing my father-son episodes I've done around Father's Day for the last couple of years. You never know what's going to happen when you have the fathers and the sons enjoying the hobby together. It's a fabulous hobby. I love the unstructured sort of no parameters. I think that would be the folks just shooting from the hip. And that's why I enjoy a lot of the shows previously mentioned, Mike Moynihan, for instance, he's not too terribly concerned about editing and things of that nature. It's not about the production. It's about a conversation, if, you're getting if, together if, with friends and you're talking about cars. If you've been successful in your business, it sounds like you have, you're not cramming anything down in your customer's throat. They're walking in. You're not telling them what to order. They're telling you what they want. And then you can do specials and things like that. So you're maybe massaging it one way or the other, but ultimately they come in because they enjoy it. They enjoy the atmosphere. They enjoy everything about it. You're creating that same thing. So I've really tried to do more listener questions. That's been fun because even though I could tell stories for a long time, I'd rather respond to some of the questions to make it relevant to what other people want. Every once in a while, I'll pontificate. If you had a bartender that was opinionated and went on tirades all the time, unless it was great entertainment, People don't always want that. They want to come in and they want a listening ear. They want the lateral and the across the counter, all that stuff. So I think if you're trying to create something like that, that ought to be in your wheelhouse. No, you're right. That's an area to be comfortable with for sure. But it, you epitomize it. And whether that helps your son understand what you do better or helps him articulate or clarify what he wants to do with the rest of his life, I think that's cool. Again, it's such a great side gig. Jeremy Lee now is... Jumping in both feet with Tag, yeah. Adam Gray, the basketball card fanatic. He's now working for PWCC. Both those guys I talked to, and I didn't try real hard to talk them out of it, but I said, be careful. When you go full-time in the industry, you no longer have a hobby. You should have seen him at a Burbank card show. He was oh. videoing just the entire time running around. Rob claims it's the epicenter of the hobby. Uh, I'm not going to fight him other than I think it's the second best yes. epicenter. There's 3.5 million people that live in Orange County alone. So if we did a card show with North County, San Diego, Orange County, and L.A., wow. Yeah. Look well, out. Look out. I am looking out because Rob is coming for me. He is coming <laughs> for you – know, DFW has 6 million people, quality and quantity, but it's just great. It's a fabulous – place and it's always been a hobby hotbed i hope it continues going back to your youtube channel the fact that you have not just so many people there but so many serious collectors when i started my podcast it was pre-covid i really thought i was going to be going to shows and bringing my microphone and my setup and having people over and that it was going to be all face to face i didn't even know what zoom was i didn't want to do telephone interviews i wanted to do face to face which Zoom is face-to-face, -face, but I'm real face-to-face. -face. You have the ability to do that, whether people want to come to your studio 
or there's other places to record on the fly, you have a great opportunity to cover events and to interview people. It's within, like you said, within 100 miles, it's just unlimited. There's definitely passionate collectors down here and clearly industry people. There's card shops throughout. It doesn't seem that there'd be any shortage of interested participants just to get together and exactly maybe that's the form is you get together and drink wine and talk about sports cars a lot of bar action is not just you with the bartender or solitary like the hobby was 50 years ago you just collected by yourself it's a group activity now so like the group conversation we had that happens in bars. That three or four guys go to a bar, they sit at a table, they enjoy the libations, and they kick back and just reminisce about the good old days or tell tall tales. So if you're creating something like, that sounds cool. I don't know what your setup is, but on Zoom, you can easily do four, five, six and manage that. If it's in person, if it's a live video, you can do it at your bar, at your restaurant. That's what I loved about March of 21 when we did the vintage conversation. Yeah. Only due to COVID, you couldn't hold your vintage dinner that year. And so you improvised and you just said, I'm going to do it on Zoom. But it was and better it in out. one sense. The dinners I had were more unruly because we had a huge table, a lot of big personalities. With Zoom, when you're talking, your little square lights up <laughs> and the other people kind of wait till you're done. And we structured it enough that everybody got their say. The dinners were more challenging. But still, like I said, I was the boss. I wasn't super heavy handed, but if you're the boss and it's your program, I think that's good. Sounds really cool. Now, what I haven't done, Jim, do a hybrid to have some people that are local and then allow Zoom participation as well. Your YouTube channel, you could have a couple of people or a person at the bar or wherever you're located and then allow some dial ins and Zoom or StreamYard participation. I think it's going to be lively. I'm trying to get into my pro bono consulting. What was always on the desk with American Idol? A can of Coke. (laughs) Probably the Coke on the table for American Idol for all those years. And you could do some fun things like that. Not necessarily product placements, but um, they just would see that this is a guy that's having fun with it. It personifies who you are. And if you had a wine of the week or a wine of the day, just for a little aside. Again, I was going to talk to Gary Vaynerchuk. The blue chip wines are like the blue chip cards. The problem is the most expensive wines, they're almost not for drinking. Yeah. And that's like the most expensive cards. I think they're not for selling. They're for just putting on the shelf and really enjoying that you have it, even though you never consummate it. Some of my Clementi stuff, I'm never going to sell it. And you're probably the same way. But then there's the drinkable wines, yeah, the wines that shouldn't stay on the shelf for too long. I just think there's lots of analogies you could have fun with because a lot of the cards are you buy them and then you sell them. But the best cards are never going to let them special go. Special in your special seller. Yeah. Not it's, in your vault, I think. It's <laughs> never getting sold. <laughs> but you're right. I have not sold cards in 25 years, probably, but I could definitely see a place where. It's time to move on from some. I imagine my wife at some point will be like, let's downsize a bit of your collection and push that product. I imagine my son will get most of it, hopefully. Uh, I flipped the script. Jeremy Lee actually got started pretty much by selling first, then talking second. If you remember his origin story, he just went on Facebook or Instagram or something. And he said, can I sell some of my old cards? You can only do old cards. And he was talking about it. He enjoyed being on air. He said, you could be the other way around. You could be enjoying your program, your channel, your community, sharing these stories. And then in a year, two, three, five, ten, whatever it is, and you say, guys, it's been a nice ride, but it's time for me to lighten my load. You're already going to have your community right there. And you could do the opposite of what Jeremy did. You could then say you'd be reaching out to the community. I'm ready to sell some stuff. And I think people would love to have some of my cards. They'd love to have some of your cards. On the outside looking at it, it doesn't sound as if you're having a ton of success moving your cards. <laughs> my goal is 1% a month. I'm falling short of that, but I'm probably a half percent a month. Oh, that's pretty probably good. Percent. Okay, so it's not negligible because it's still a lot of cards. Yeah. But I shipped out several thousand cards today ah. for eBay lots. I may have made my 1% this month. I don't know. <laughs> but I have too many cards. Yeah. But 
nobody cares except it could be a platform. If I really wanted to sell, I could put on eBay some videos of cards I want to sell, but I don't want to do that, but I could. And you could as well. So I'm saying as the time comes, if I had a bad health problem or something, yeah, I would be way more aggressive in selling cards. Uh-huh. Yeah. And these are the platforms to do it, all these social media things. I'm already doing eBay. I've got an eBay concept. I've got a Com C concept. Yeah, please, um, everybody, I, the, yeah. I think that will probably be the biggest blow to my ego in any YouTube shows, especially since I'm not going to appeal to modern collectors. No, but you're uh, going to talk about what you like. You're not going to talk about what you don't like. If they say, how come you don't talk about modern cards? Just say, I like vintage cards better. I want to talk about the stuff I like the most. Anything that promotes the hobby is great. I think if you collect modern, that's fantastic. I definitely don't want to rain on anyone's parade there. It's just more along the lines of, hey, this is me. This is what I'm passionate about. And you do you. I'm going to do me. But the more people that get into car collecting, the better for the hobby all the way around. There's a knowledge base, an assumption that you'll need to make about your listeners, about your viewers. And me, I'm trying to be all over the place because I have some that beginners could understand and some when I'm on with Rich, if you're not pretty into it, you're going to be lost. But depending on your frequency, are you going to have some shows that are more introductory and some that are more advanced? It's the first time somebody walks into one of your bars, you've got to coach them up or help them to enjoy the experience. Hand-holding experience just exactly. to navigate the wine selection. Yeah. Mike Moynihan, I think, Pretty much he's looking for people that already are thinking vintage is pretty cool and they'd like to learn a little bit more about it. Mariani, again, those guys make it fun. And they also continue to say that they're learning along the way as well, which I think is very encouraging for people that come along. They say, these guys have been doing it for decades and they're still learning. You're never going to know it all. It's very similar to the wine industry. I learn something every day. Any parallel you can throw out there with wine, they can't criticize you for talking about wine. It's another passion for you. For people that only have one hobby, that's okay if it's sports cards. But have more than one hobby is not a bad thing. You're going to be mainly YouTube once a week? I think initially, probably once a week. So once a week, and like I said, this could be a fabulous experience for your son. And you could ask him, say, look, I'm committing to do this once a week. I'd like you to help me in a variety of ways. I don't really know what you would really like to do, but I'd like for us to experiment with some things. I'm going to have some other people coming on and helping. But what is it that interests you in this? Because everybody's a content creator on Facebook and Instagram and all that. So he may have some great ideas. He may want to be in front of the camera, behind the camera. Editing is tough, I think, for video. So do it right the first time, Jim. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate your time. Well, thanks, Jim.